Right. Okay, uh, so thanks again for the invitation. I want to especially thank um, uh, Jan Luigi for reaching out to me. And um, this uh, presentation is going to be a preprint of ours uh, that we submitted to NeurIPS this year, actually, uh, which is called a DAVI Automatic Dual Amortized Variational Inference. And we apply this technology to pyramidal phasion models. So as I said before, this project is part of the uh, bigger Newland project, which is in my team. Um, the presentation should be 40 to 45 minutes long. Uh, first, I will do a general problem statement, then I will do uh, present the main contributions, the methodological contributions uh, of our preprint, then I will go over some experimental results before making some conclusive remarks. So first I'll make a general problem statement and this uh, statement is going to be both experimental and theoretical. Basically, we are interested in a certain class of problems and uh, this class of problems motivates the technology that we have basically developed. And so uh, the two of them are kind of intertwined in that sense. So um, in this work, we are interested in pyramidal experimental setups. Um, this model is extracted, for instance, from uh, Kong and colleagues in 2018, and it's called the multi-scale hierarchical Bayesian model. Um, so this will be our running examples through the whole of this presentation. Basically, this model's functional connectivity uh, via a hierarchical Bayesian model. Uh, and this connectivity features multiple scales for variability. We have in this population study multiple subjects and multiple measurement sessions per subject. And for a given measurement session, we have multiple brain vertices for which we measure the fMRI signal. Uh, is is the um, is the screen being cropped or because I got this red lining all over it? Do you see the the red the the right parts of the brains, for instance? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's not. I think it's okay. I can. Well, I do see the whole screen. There's okay. the green line. I'm not sure. So you see the number of the slide bottom right? Yeah. Okay. That, that's weird. There's this green line for me. Well, anyway. Um, so as I said, this uh, kind of example is going to be our running example in this presentation. What we wish to perform from these uh, hierarchical Bayesian models is inference. So considering some latent parameters theta, for instance, in this case, subject level functional networks, uh, and some observed data X, so for instance, the vertices connectivity as measured in a given session, the generative hierarchical Bayesian model defines the joint probability of the data and the latent parameters. So P of X and theta is the conditional probability of X given theta times the prior probability of the parameters theta. In inference, our goal is to obtain the posterior distribution of theta given X. Uh, furthermore, we are placing ourselves in the amortized setup, meaning that once we have paid for a certain training overhead, we want to obtain the posterior distribution of theta given any data point x. So that differs from classical methods such as MCMC or classical VI, uh, in which we wish to obtain the posterior only for a given point x0, right? Here we want to obtain this in the most general setup. So uh, a popular framework to perform inference is variational inference. Um, one of the reasons of this popularity, in my opinion, uh, is because it posits the problem as an optimization, right? So we consider a certain variational family big Q, and we look in this family for the function that is closest to a target, that is to say the posterior distribution of theta given x. We'll see later that this notion of closeness is measured by means of a functional divergence, uh, like the kullback leibler for instance. So VI has made a lot of uh, progress in the recent years and now leverages, for instance, automatic differentiation in modern machine learning framework to look for this optimal function. So in itself, um, variational inference is not an approximate inference technique, right? Uh, it's just that we generally look for a variational family that is tractable. And if the correct uh, posterior distribution is not present in this family, then our method is basically amortized. So the trick in VI is to look for a tractable variational family that are yet expressive enough. In this uh, vast landscape, structured VI aims at exploiting the forward model structure to improve even further the variational family. So this is the case, for instance, of uh, uh, works that you may have heard of, like automatic structured VI uh, or cascading flows recently. So we place ourselves in this line of a structured VI. I also uh, noted here the work of Weilbach and colleagues in which they basically uh, made a structured normalizing flow. 
uh, masking the flow basically on the condition dependency structure of a Bayesian model. So uh, if we come back to a running example, uh, we can see that we have massive dimensionality. So let's consider a population network uh, presented at the top of the graph. This network is of dimensionality greater than uh, 1k, uh, for instance. Then uh, from this uh, population network, we will make several independent rows for subject networks. Uh, in this work, 40 different subjects. And then for every single subject, we will make four different rows for session networks. So if we count the total number of parameters in this, we have the number of subjects times the number of sessions times the dimensionality of a given connectivity vector. That gives us up to 5 million parameters. And this prohibits traditional methods, uh, or at least we need to be clever about them to use them in such a, a um, complex setup. Uh, and one of the reasons we basically construct this automatic uh, uh, methodology, uh, Adavi, is to remove that need to be a, basically a technical expert to be able to, to apply Bayesian methods to these kind of examples, as we will see later in the experimental part. So a representation can I, of- Can I, uh, can I, can I interrupt you or I wait for you when you finish? No, no, you can interrupt me at any point. Sorry, uh, I should have- uh, So the parameters, when you talk about the parameters, uh, you are referring to exactly? So the parameters is uh, not the parameters of a neural network like the weights. It's really like the par parameters in the Bayesian sense. Um, so it's the parameters that are defined uh, by uh, the hierarchical Bayesian model. And we call them parameters okay, as opposed to observed data, right? But uh, you have here the muse. I suppose that well, I, I just wait for your explanation and then we can discuss it. No, no, we, we can discuss it now if you want. Like, uh, yes, everything presented here is parameters. Uh, basically, the observed data is not present. So the parameters are both uh, like the population networks, but also the subject network and also the session networks. It's all those networks that we want to retrieve uh, in the same inference process. But it turns out that we know the structure of this problem and the hierarchical Bayesian model it is associated to. But uh, in a more general setup, we would basically concatenate everything into the theta. Uh, parameter, basically. OK, OK. Uh, and this is the dimensionality of that total parameter space that is 5 million, basically. So um, we can see that there is a massive dimensionality for the ground HBM, and this makes the representation a bit cluttered, right? So uh, the graphical models community has come up with templates to basically synthetically represent that kind of models. And a very famous template is the plate enriched template. So here we can see on the left, the ground graph that we just presented. And on the right is an equivalent representation uh, using a plate enriched uh, graph template. So uh, here we have uh, two such plates, the subject plate that is denoted with an S and the session plate denoted with a T. And basically uh, we have also some template random variables for instance, the big MS corresponds to the stacking of all the random variables mu1 to mu s. And the big MST corresponds to the stacking of mu11 to mu st. There's the one to one correspondence between the two once we know the parametric form, basically, and also the cardinality of the plates that are involved. So now that we have presented this representation, uh, we can dive a bit deeper into what is the principle of a DAVI. Uh, so those plates, they translate IID sampling from a common distribution, so identically distributed sampling. And this is a strong symmetry in the forward HBM. Basically, if we consider the ground graph, we have identical subgraphs, multiple identical subgraphs. And the fact that we represent this using a template allows us to underline that symmetry that exists. So Adavi's main idea is to exploit that symmetry to reduce the variational family's number of parameters. We will also see as a byproduct that we improve its performance, but the real goal is to reduce the number of parameters. So here, uh, because it may be a bit confusing, the number of parameters in this case is weights. So it's actually like uh, the weights uh, of the variational family that we will train. Um, basically, we want to scale this parameterization uh, over the dimensionality of the graph template and not the dimensionality of the ground graph. So hopefully that statement will become a bit clearer in, in the next slides, but that's really like the, the gist of it. So uh, now that I've made this general presentation, we can kind of break down the acronym ADAVI. So ADAVI is a technique that is automatic and dual. So let's consider, for instance, on the right, that we have a forward model that goes from some parameters, latent parameters theta, to some observed data x. Basically, we will automatically construct a dual model that goes from the observed data x to the parameters theta. 
uh, and this uh, variational family is going to be able to perform inference in the amortized setup, meaning that one strain, the posterior, could be readily available for every data point X and not uh, the point uh, the method has been uh, specialized upon, let's say. Um, and lastly, uh, ADAVI is a VI technique, so we will use optimization to derive that uh, variational posterior. In the second part of the presentation, um, do you have any questions at this point? Uh, is it clear for you, Pablo, now? Or? Yeah, well, I have some terminology troubles, but I think uh, Luca can also help me there because uh, it says dual because he's doing the backward, uh, but it, for me, it's the inverse model somehow. So I, I'm not sure about Yeah, that. it's a, it's also what we call like in the inverse model some, sometimes, yeah. Okay. So the duality uh, thing, I understand perfectly, but I assume that this is a keyword that you use. Okay. The the what, sorry? So the, the duality for me in optimization. Uh, yeah, so the notion of duality is quite, thing. yeah, it's a, no, it's rather something that we try to coin for this. It's really like underline the symmetry that will appear clear uh, later on, hopefully, between uh, the forward model that we construct uh, and uh, the backward model. And so this notion of backward is indeed related to the notion of inverse problem. And why we call it backward is because basically we will run the conditional dependencies in the reverse order compared to what the forward model is doing. So that's why we, we called it backward. Um, so in the second part of the presentation, I will do a methodological overview. And the first uh, part of it is to describe the class of models we are interested in. And those are called pyramidal HBMs. So a pyramidal HBM is basically a simpler class of problems to build our proof of concept architecture, right? But it's yet expressive enough to encompass some real life models. Uh, for instance, the running example that we have for the functional connectivity in the brain. So uh, if we were to do a one liner definition, a pyramidal HBM is a subclass of plate and rich HBMs with a single stack of plates and a single observed data at the bottom. So I will make some uh, graphical representation for it, for the concept to become hopefully clear. So um, a first uh, visual definition of it is that we ha don't have any colliding plates. So on the left is a correct example of a pyramidal HBM and on the right is an incorrect example. On the right, we can see that we basically have uh, intertwined plates, uh, which uh, corresponds to colliders in the forward model. So this is not a class of models that we try to tackle uh, in this work. What we are interested in is models like the one on the left, where basically the uh, yellowish plate is stacked on top of the green one, which is stacked on top of the purple one. And so that create this kind of stacking, uh, hence the name pyramid uh, of plates. The fact that we have a single pyramid of plates actually helps us define the notion of a random variables hierarchy. So the hierarchy is how high is a random variable in that pyramid. So for instance, here we have three random variables, A, B, C. C is at the basis of the pyramid, so it's hierarchy 0, B is hierarchy 1, and A is hierarchy 2. Um, now that we have defined the notion of random variables hierarchy, we can specify a second constraint for the pyramidal HBMs, which is that we want to have a unique observed data that is positioned at the last hierarchy, so the basis of the pyramid. So the example on the left, uh, feature section example, uh, if we take the convention of the gray node being basically the observed node uh, in the uh, graphical model, um, the example on the left one is correct, but the one on the right is incorrect because the gray node is at hierarchy one and is basically placed in the middle of the pyramid and not at the basis. So this is what we call pyramidal HBMs. Uh, now that I have defined the class of models we apply our technology upon, I will define this technology and its two main building blocks. So the first block is a hierarchical encoder that will encode the observed data X across the multiple hierarchies. And the second building block is a set of conditional density estimators that approximate the posterior distribution and will review sequentially these two items. And so the first one is the hierarchical encoder. So um, the role of the hierarchical encoder is to sequentially contract the plates in the observed data X to produce multiple encodings. So this notion of contraction is hopefully going to become clearer uh, than again, but it basically results in uh, encodings of lower and lower order, 
uh, order between the number of dimensions that we have in a tensor, basically. So uh, using the hierarchical encoder, we will produce one encoding per hierarchy level. And basically, the, this, this encoding is later going to be used for the inference of the posterior distribution of every random variable that shares this hierarchy. The idea in the hierarchical encoder is to exploit the uh, identically distributed IID symmetry across a plate using multiple stacked set transformers. So set transformers is an architecture uh, that we leverage from Lee and colleagues in 2019. And this is basically an attention-based neural network uh, that exploits what is called here the permutation invariance across a plate. Um, which is the same from a statistical point of view as uh, exchangeability and, uh, and the fact that we have IID sampling from a common conditional distribution. Uh, when we think about it, uh, attention architecture is, uh, is a natural fit for IID data because the fact that we uh, use transformers in deep learning for sequential data is actually due, due to an encoding trick in which we encode the sequentiality of the information uh, inside the sequence. But in itself, attention is kind of a, a good fit for uh, permutation invariant data. Um, it is uh, good to, to state at this point that the hierarchical encoder is the, uh, the item that is responsible for the amortization of our variational family. Um, a statement that will hopefully uh, be explained uh, in the next slide. So uh, what is a hierarchical encoder? In this slide, I basically represent two different things. On the left, we have a generative HBM. And on the right, we have the structure of the hierarchical encoder. So as stated before, this notion of duality of symmetry should become clear with that slide. Uh, we can see that the structure of uh, the hierarchical encoder is basically mimicking the one of uh, the generative HBM on the left. So in this generative HBM, we have four random variables, A, B, C, and D, with the observed random variable D that is located at the basis of a stack of plates. So there are two such plates, the plates 0 and the plate 1 with B and C belonging to plate one, and D belonging to both plate one and plate zero. Um, basically, this observed uh, data is going to be first processed by a set transformer ST0. And this set transformer is going to produce the encoding E1. So E1 is later on going to be used for the inference of all the random variables that are of hierarchy one. So in this case, B and C. We can see that uh, basically ST0 contracted the plate uh, 0. Then ST1 is going to process E1 and contract the plate 1 to produce the encoding E2. And E2 is later going to be used for the inference of the variables of hierarchy 2. And in this case, there's only A. Um, what is not clearly apparent uh, maybe in this, uh, in this slide is the fact that we have uh, what we call function mapping. So if I uh, restate uh, what I just said about ST0, the set transformer ST0 contracts the plate P0. But what is important to note is that it does this operation in parallel across the plate P1. So this means that we basically share the parameterization of ST0 for multiple operations. And basically, ST0 is going to produce as many encodings as the cardinality of P1. So uh, the encoding E1 is a high order tensor that could be slides basically into like uh, more elementary encodings. Uh, this may look like an implementation detail, uh, but this is actually an essential feature of the architecture because this is how we reduce our total number of parameters by applying uh, functions uh, on similar patterns of data and producing uh, elementary uh, results with those. Uh, so in this slide, I basically uh, show two equivalent representation of the same uh, hierarchical Bayesian model. So on the left, we have uh, the graph template, uh, which is basically the same as before. We just removed uh, the random variable C. And on the right is the ground equivalent of uh, that uh, hierarchical uh, model, uh, where we consider that both plate 1 and 0 are of cardinality 2. So what we mean with function mapping is that we will take the function st0 and we will first apply it to d11 and d12. And this will basically produce the encoding e11. And then we will take the same function, but we will apply it now on d21 and d22 to produce the encoding e12. 
And so the encoding big E1 is actually the stacking of those two encodings and in an order two tensor in that sense. Uh, later on, we will see that E11 will be used for the inference of B1 and E12 for the inference of B2. So now that we have encoded uh, hierarchically this data, uh, we will construct conditional density estimators. So um, if we look at the structure that we have presented here on the right, which is the same example with random variables A, B, C, and D, in this case, we have three latent random variable templates, right? Uh, A, B, and C. And in our method, we will construct three separate density estimators. Uh, so QA of A, QB of B, and QC of C, uh, which will respectively approximate the posterior distribution of A given D, B given D, and C given D. Um, it's important to note here that we construct a density estimator per random variable template uh, and not per random variable of the ground graph, meaning that uh, as for the set transformer, we'll basically share the same conditional density estimators for multiple random variables in the ground graph. Um, so if we complement the visual representation that we had before, uh, where we represented the uh, hierarchical encoder on the right of the generative HBM, we basically complement that architecture with uh, conditional density estimators. So E1 is going to be used uh, to condition the inference on uh, B tilde and C tilde, uh, and E2 for A tilde, where basically A tilde, B tilde, C tilde are the random variables that are distributed according to the variational distributions, QA, QB, and QC, respectively. So in this representation, the notion of duality between the two is even clearer because we have uh, one variational uh, random variable in that sense, corresponding one to one to uh, one latent random variable uh, in the generative HBM. So uh, what is a density estimator? It's just a combination of two different items. The first one is what we could call a universal density estimator in the real unbounded space. Uh, so for this, we use normalizing close, which is a technology uh, that has been introduced first by Rosendi and colleagues in 2016. And for it, for instance, there's an excellent review by Papa Makarios and colleagues in 2019. So uh, normalizing flow is a diffeomorphism that re-parameterizes a standard normal distribution into a more complex distribution. So the fact that we push uh, a complex distribution into uh, a standard normal distribution is what gives the name normalizing flows. So this is a very um, active research uh, area recently. And uh, our point is not really to um, promote a new architecture of normalizing flow, it's rather to be agnostic to the technology of normalizing flow that we use and to leverage those to obtain very expressive density estimators. Okay. Um, the second item that composes a density estimator is a link function. So as we stated, the normalizing flow is only able to produce a different morphism in the real unbounded space, right? So with a link function, a uh, term that uh, basically is inherited from generalized linear models, for instance, um, we project that unbounded space to the constrained space in which the random variable evolves. So for instance, if the parameter that is considered is a variance parameter, we know it needs to be strictly positive. So we will use uh, an exponential function as a bijector projecting the real space to uh, the space of strictly positive real numbers. Um, a more complex example is if we consider some mixture parameter, right? So all the, uh, all the values in the parameter needs to sum to one, and we can basically construct a diffeomorphism uh, from the real unbounded space onto the simplex. Uh, and this allows us to have some expressivity. So this is not really novel, this usage of link function. Probably a lot of people actually use it uh, in the inference community. But uh, we just wanted to make it clear and systematic in the presentation. So we will systematically use the combination of a link function and normalizing flows uh, in our case, even if that link function uh, can be the identity sometimes. Um, what is also like uh, important for density estimators is that just as for set transformers, they are applied in parallel across plates. Uh, like I said, we build a density estimator per random variable template and not per ground uh, random variable, right? So for instance, the density estimator QB 
for the random variable template big B is going to be applied in parallel across plate P1 and is going to share its parameterization for the inference of both B1 and B2. Um, we therefore uh, infer B1 and B2, by the way, independently, which is a feature of, uh, of that. Um, so there's no conditional dependence between the two uh, at the time of inference. Um, what is also important to notice is that for amortization purposes, the density estimation from QB is going to be conditioned by the encoding E1. So the encoding that were produced by the hierarchical encoder before. Um, so if we take the same example as before, where we have uh, the graph template on the left and the ground graph on the right, we saw before that we were using uh, the function st0 to produce encoding e11, right? Uh, applying st0 to d11 and d12. Basically, e11 is going to be used for the inference of v1. And the same goes for b2, uh, the encoding that results from the encoding uh, of d21 and d22 is going to be used for the inference of b2. So uh, if we factorize basically the uh, density estimator QB of B is going to be the times of um, the product, sorry, of Q of B1 given E11 times Q of B2 given E12. Um, so now that all those elements uh, have been presented, we can summarize what is uh, the, the look of a density estimator with this slide. So a density estimator uh, is basically a two-step diffeomorphism from a standard normally distributed uh, random variable to our variational distribution. Um, and note in this case that the normalizing flow uh, is a learnable diffeomorphism that is also going to be conditioned by the encoding that is produced by the hierarchical encoder. So since both the normalizing flow and the link function are diffeomorphisms, this allows us for the computation of the density using the change of variable formula. Uh, people interested could go to the excellent review of Papa Rakaios and colleagues in 2019. So um, that concludes the presentation of an individual density estimator. Now we just have to combine uh, all those estimators. And for this, we use uh, what is called in VI a mean field approximation which amounts in not modeling statistical dependencies in the posterior between different random variable templates. Uh, I want to specify this point, uh, especially because there are experts in VI in the, uh, in the room, that um, this is an implementation choice. And uh, this is not something that is a necessity for the architecture. The, the goal was more or less to make a proof of concept architecture, but we could really leverage this idea of sharing parameterization across plates even for a variational family that would feature conditional dependence uh, in, the, uh, in the variational family. Uh, so, uh, so for, uh, yes. Of course, uh, I got your point. Uh, just that in this case, with the model source structure, with this hierarchical structure, it sounds a bit a pity to me to just go for statistical independence, since uh, probably you can get quite suboptimal convergence and you lose quite some interesting structure. That is true. Um, I, I, won't, I won't hide that. Uh, basically, this is one of the main limitations to me uh, in the model. And this is something that I've been basically improving upon in a later iteration. It's just that uh, we wanted to refine uh, in this work uh, uh, to just present what was like the main concept, right? And, and leave everything rather simple. Um, if, if I can say a few words about this uh, is that, however, if we want to model uh, statistical dependencies in the posterior, the question is how we can do this by still preserving the symmetry of the system. Um, so for instance, if we only take the posterior dependencies that are encoded in the prior, uh, so the one from the forward model, uh, we basically preserve that symmetry. But if we want to also encode statistical dependencies that arise from colliders and stuff like that, uh, we can basically uh, lose this property of being able to use the same conditional density estimators for multiple different random variables inside the same plate. Uh, so it's why, in my opinion, it's not straightforward to go for a variational family that features conditional dependencies in the sense that we want to be able to do this parallelization inside. But I do um, agree this is a, a big limitation. 
I mean, my point is that at least you should use the structure of the prior because you get a very structured prior here, which has the this is what I do in the in the next iteration. Yeah, to be honest, exactly. I then use of course, the structure uh, of the prior and. Uh, yeah. For the posterior is quite more complicated. I, I can assume that you can find some super set of symmetries that you can fit some level of approximation of coupling, uh, of colliding yes. coupling in the posterior. So that would be interesting. But I think at least it's important to. If you want to basically find a, uh, so in this literature it's called an I map uh, of the forward model that goes in the backward direction. So for instance, uh, something that is in the line of research of Valbar and colleagues uh, is, is basically this graph inversion uh, for inference. The problem is that it introduces, for instance, edges that are, uh, uh, I, may, I may say, horizontal in a plate, right? Between different random variables in the same plate because of collider structure, for instance. Um, and so uh, it's probably hard to actually model exactly only the conditional dependencies that we want. Either we go for a subset of those dependencies, for instance, the ones that are encoded in the prior, or we basically add many dependencies on top of the necessary one, but we make the inference task more complex in that sense because we, we have less guidance uh, over the kind of dependencies that we should look for. So um, it, it's kind of a, yeah, I guess you, you can't have it all in, in that sense. Uh, at least if we want to exploit uh, the structure and parallelize to the maximum the way we try to do in this technique. Um, but yeah, I guess it, this amounts to kind of like a, some strategy in, in the, the publication, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We wanted to have something that is very elementary uh, and not go for something that would multiply many different items uh, uh, individually complex enough. Um, so in this case, yes, so we have uh, a mean field approximation, meaning that Q of A, B, C is going to be the product of Q, A of A times Q, B of B times Q, C of C. And now that we have an expression for a variational family, uh, we can fit that to the posterior of A, B, C given D. And for this, we will use a, a reverse callback label divergence that amounts to an elbow, uh, but in the amortized setup. If we summarize everything into one single figure that is actually extracted from the preprints, so we have one generative HBM on the left with uh, random variables lambda, gamma, and x. x is the observed one. And this produces uh, some simulated data. So uh, in this uh, model, we have uh, two plates, p0, p1, and three levels of hierarchy, 0, 1, and 2. So the simulated data X is first going to be processed by set transformer ST0 to produce the encoding E1. E1 is going to be used for the inference of gamma, which has a hierarchy one. Then E1 is going to be processed by set transformer ST1 to produce the encoding E2, which is later going to be used for the inference of lambda. Um, from the API point of view, uh, actually invite uh, people who would be interested to check out our GitHub under Neuralang. Uh, and I created an API that is based on top of TensorFlow probability and that is also a Keras API. So uh, the variational family that we construct are Keras models that can be easily trained even for non-machine uh, learning uh, aficionados. Um, so here we basically construct a generative HBM from line seven to 15. It's just a Gaussian random effects in this case. Then we construct some keyword arguments where we basically feed the generative HBM, uh, the notion of uh, what random variables belongs to which hierarchy and the link functions. Probably in a later iteration, uh, those link functions and hierarchies could be directly inferred from the model and needn't be specified by the user. Then we declare the variational family. And uh, we can generate some train data and validation data from the generative HBM. We can simply, like a Keras model, compile and fit the model onto some train data. And then, because it's amortized, we can take any validation datum and uh, sample parameters condition to that data. Um, so that's it for the methodological overview. Uh, in the third part, I will present some experimental results. So here, I kind of want to make a, some kind of disclaimer um, in the sense that I was a bit taken by the time, at the time of writing the paper. And so um, the results that I have are also a lot visual. Uh, so this may like the big quantitative uh, table that everyone likes in the community 
also because it's kind of hard in inference to to create very uh, impactful uh, yet controlled and uh, examples for which we have access to ground truth. Oh, so uh, that's uh, when I read the preprint of your work. I mean, I really liked the methodological part, but I did find yeah that indeed the experiment part was very lacking, and yes, I, I found that, that it was a bit true. of a pity. I think you should have waited a bit before. Uh, because uh, eventually, sometimes, usually people read things once, you know, and mm -hmm. let's say that I, I read it and then I say, okay, but I don't know if it's going to work. Maybe. You see, because of course, there are always reasons, right? But uh, I could think, oh, maybe this doesn't work very well. That's why there is not much effort in doing the experiments, which I don't think is the case in this situation. You're absolutely right. And uh, to be perfectly candid with you, this is also... Uh, the what the reviewers at, uh, at NeurIPS have been thinking. And uh, I'm working on the second version of the paper uh, for which I spent uh, more months into, uh, into experiments to have uh, more quantitative uh, additional baselines, including, for instance, cascading flows uh, and uh, that kind of stuff. So hopefully uh, an ulterior version of the paper uh, would uh, correct that lacking. Okay, looking forward. Um, but first, I need to introduce what was the baseline of comparison in that preprint. Um, and uh, this amounts to what we basically trying to do with Adavi, right? So with Adavi, we exploit the structure of the forward HPM and we factorize the parameter space into multiple subspaces corresponding to multiple normalizing flow blocks. And we furthermore solve in parallel multiple similar inference tasks, so across a plate, using a common conditional density estimator. So that's why uh, in this preprint, our point of comparison is a single big normalizing flow that wouldn't exploit this structure and simply model uh, the joint distribution for the total parameter space for theta, right? And, and for this, we use a point of comparison, uh, for instance, that was uh, NPEC, Neural Posterior Estimation by Greenberg and Colling in 2019. Um, so in a first model, we basically consider Gaussian random effects uh, for which we have some population mean in two dimensions that we call mu. Uh, from a Gaussian distribution that is centered on this population mean, we draw several group means, mu1, mu2, and mu3. And for every group 1 to 3, uh, we draw 50 points uh, from a Gaussian centered on the group mean. And this uh, basically creates the observed data x. So this is a very elementary uh, model with two plates, the group plate and the sampling plate. And the goal is to infer the posterior distribution of the group means and the population mean given x. There are two plates in this level and three levels of hierarchy. Uh, so the first result is actually kind of a graphical one, even if we can actually compute uh, Kullback Leiber divergence with the theoretical posterior in this example. This is why we also like kept it kind of simple. So here we have two different data points. And uh, on the left is the data where we have uh, basically blobs of points that corresponds to different groups, uh, the orange, blue, and green ones. And on the center and the right column, we have inference results. So samples from the posterior distribution of the group means and the population mean. Uh, I also like uh, drew on those uh, some black circles that indicate the theoretical ground truth, right? So what basically needs to be seen here is that both methods perform relatively well, so NPC and ours, and uh, basically sample points that are located uh, in the vicinity of the black circle that corresponds to the theoretical ground truth. But uh, the real point is not actually like, uh, do we improve on the quality of the posterior? The point is to see how we scale with respect to plate dimensionality, for instance. Uh, so uh, if we consider the total number of parameters in this model, uh, we can see that it grows with the plate size G. So if we add more groups, this means that we have more group means to infer. Uh, and the normalizing flows parameterization basically scales quadratically with the size of the parameter space. So uh, in this example, this means that the parameterization of a single big normalizing flow would be uh, proportional to G squared times D squared. But in our case, uh, since we share the parameterization across the plate G, we only have a D squared parameterization. If we generalize this with, uh, for an example, with M different plates, we have a card of P1 squared, where P1 is the first plate, times, et cetera, times card of PM squared times D squared for a single big normalizing flow, whereas we only have um, something that is in the order magnitude of M times D squared. 
So scaling linearly with the number of plates, but not with the plate dimensionality. So if we take the same model and we basically increase uh, the dimensionality of that plate from three to 15 and to 30, we can compare the quality of the posterior obtained, the number of parameters and the computing time. So this is kind of work in progress and that is going to be complemented uh, in the second iteration of the paper. But what needs to be seen here is that compared to NPC, we have constant parameterization, more favorable computing time, and also uh, actually a better um, C2ST metric uh, for the quality of the posterior. But I don't want to dwell too much on this uh, because NPC doesn't achieve good performance even if the low dimensionality case. So probably another baseline like uh, cascading flows that have been implemented uh, could uh, be a more valid uh, line of comparison. So you cannot uh, standard mean field is the too difficult to I also yeah, it... did standard mean field uh, and MCMC. So basically this amounts to like four to five baselines in the second paper. Okay. I don't present yeah. them here because um, usually there can be a confusion because mean field can provide very good result, but it's not amortized. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like comparing apples with uh, with oranges, right? Yeah, uh, but it's better than nothing. So I do agree with you. I mean, you, of course you can amortize the mean field and then it's, uh, but honestly, it's still better than nothing. So it's, if you don't have- uh, Yeah, in the complete theory. version of the table, there is a mean field yeah. and an MCMC and a, several other different yeah. techniques. I mean, eventually it's, a, it's an advantage of, you give an advantage to the mean field to not be amortized. Yeah, but you uh, have to be very clear in that statement because yeah. like um, basically the a mean field will have more favorable computing time yeah. and probably better uh, posterior performance if you provide with the right parametric family for the mean field, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I think then you should give the you should compute the computing time should give per image. So for the amortized, you just, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to compare it exactly. And yeah, you're right that it's difficult to compare amortized and non amortized. But, um, but anyway, I, I do compare them uh, in, a, in a later iteration. Um, I prefer to make, basically make things clear, only present things here that are related to the first preprint. So maybe that's a bad design choice. But, um, but yeah, that's the one I have made anyway. Um, and in the last experimental part, I just quickly go over some uh, neuroimaging experiment. This is basically the motivating examples that we had, right? So we are interested in Broca's area functional parcellation. And so Broca's area is a brain uh, region that is located in the inferior frontal gyrus and that is traditionally associated to language. Um, and anatomically, Broca's area can be usually split into two parts, the pars triangularis and the pars opercularis. And our goal in this experiment is to recover that binary split, but using a functional parcellation that is based on fMRI data. Uh, in this work, we consider some connectivity vectors, meaning how is a given brain vertex wired to the rest of the brain? So this is a functional definition that is actually related to the co activation of blood deoxygenation in fMRI. So the data is from the Human Connectome Project and has been processed with the kind of help of Dr. Thomas Yeo and Dr. Ru Kong uh, that actually produced the original uh, hierarchical model. So in this example, we have multiple scales of variability, right? Uh, so we adapt the model from Kong and colleagues to only consider two distinct connectivity networks, mu1, mu1 and mu2. And then for every subjects, uh, we will have connectivity networks mu s1 and mu s2 that are going to be variations for the population networks. But those connectivity networks for individuals also vary across time, resulting in session specific connectivity networks mu st1 and mu st2. And then for a given subject and session, a given brain vertex can express a connectivity that is the variation of either one of those two connectivity networks, which is a mixture model. Um, this gives to every vertex a label uh, meaning does it correspond to the network one or network two? And this uh, gives the name parcellation in this case. So uh, this gives a total of parameters of 300K, which is quite, quite big. Uh, but uh, even if this presentation is a bit confusing, why I want to go with it is that all this variability is encompassed into a single hierarchical model and with an end-to-end -end probabilistic treatment. And that to me showcases the strength of the Bayesian approach. 
But the problem is that though, though those methods can be very appealing, inference usually requires a lot of work and strong methodological knowledge. So the, this involves analytical derivations, lengthy method building, tuning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, for instance, in the original implementation, Kong and colleagues use a manually derived expectation maximization procedures with pages and pages of equations, and that placed them in, in very tight spots in which they are both neuroimaging experts, but at the same time, uh, they have a mathematically equipped uh, to deal with those methodologies, and that creates huge barriers to entry for most experimenters. And that's it. Even that's even reinforced by the fact that we have very high dimensionality, right? And so um, this prohibits any naive approach, and this doubles down on the methodological knowledge that is required. So with Adavi, we basically place ourselves in the line of automatic BI, and we want to construct something that is seamless to use for experimenters once the forward model has been expressed in a modern probabilistic framework. That's really the idea be behind uh, uh, this uh, automatic dual derivation. So our exploitation of plates allows us to perform inference quickly and therefore to apply it to a data regime where existing methods would quickly become intractable or would require many, many uh, legwork, that is to say, and uh, methodological expertise to be able to tune them uh, for the problem at hand. So if we apply this method uh, to the broadcast area parcellation, we can obtain population networks that describe wiring to the rest of the cortex. Here we have, for instance, colored spots that mark the top 99% of the connectivity for both networks, red and blue. And on the right, we have uh, what we call the parcellation, which is uh, the functional cartography uh, for that region. So reddish and bluish parts represent posterior probability for the vertex to have a certain label. And what's interesting is that since we have a probabilistic treatment, we also have whitish parts, and that means uncertainty. So at the population level, we don't really know uh, if that part of the brain belongs to uh, that network or that other network. Uh, what's also interesting is that since it's a hierarchical model, we can uh, derive all those results, but at the subject level. And we can obtain soft parcellations for different HCP subjects. So here I represented three. And uh, what's interesting here is that we have three different parcellations uh, and very, very different parcellations. So the red and the blue parts uh, of the brain vary widely from one subject to another. And that is kind of interesting because we have a model for this uncertainty. We have uh, va variance parameters that correspond to it, uh, but we can still uh, obtain population uh, parameters um, from those. And that concludes that very brief presentation. I'm preparing a more neuroimaging publication that is actually based on this work. Uh, so that's why it's not very, very stuffed uh, right now. Uh, in the last part, I will make some quick conclusive remarks. And the first ones are related to methodological extensions. Um, so Adavi leverages a simple principle, right? We have the IID symmetry that is introduced by plates, and we want to translate the symmetry into some shared parameterization, both for the encoding and the density estimation. But in doing so, we also made many limiting implementation details. And what I want to underline with that slide is that uh, those limitations are not tied to the method itself. For instance, the pyramidal class of models, the mean field approximation, or the fact that we do only amortized inference. And so uh, this could be changed, uh, basically, is the point of future work. We wanted to keep like things uh, very concentrated on the, the working principle. Is insights into inference in general, even if meager. Uh, so Adavi is an example of the gains we can have for exploiting the structure of an inference problem, right? And so we do so to reduce the parameterization of our family rather than boosting its performance. But the idea is to really like exploit that structure. Um, and if, if we take a step back, I think that the idea of Adavi is actually to derive the structured variational family from the graph template and not from the ground graph. So basically, by basing ourselves on the graph template, we can exploit symmetries that exist in the ground graph. And it turns out that there exist different types of graph templates. Uh, for instance, temporal models, which is an example of a Bayesian graph template. So maybe that kind of line of thinking could be generalized to, to different kind of templates. Um, but anyway, um, we share with structured VI the uh, idea of like automatically deriving uh, some variational families. And uh, I think this is a promising road in the future. I expect to see like more and more effective automatic variational inference methodologies where you basically would seamlessly feed a forward model and have the inference uh, constructed for you uh, with a very efficient um, and tractable uh, variational family.
Because to me, the kind of uh, really take home message from this presentation is that we took a complex real life neuroimaging experiment and we performed a fully Bayesian treatment for it. Hopefully in doing so, uh, trying to advance the capabilities for Bayesian methods in general and making them more experimental friendly. But it, this is actually like, we could take Bayesian methods and apply them to a very, very complex setup, uh, which is um, what I'm proud about basically in this, uh, in this work. So thank you for your attention. Um, in the slide deck, there's also like a list of all the bibliography. Probably I can send it to you afterwards. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you very much, Luis. It was uh, really interesting, and I'm really looking forward to see some uh, some more results, especially the neuroscience one. To be honest, because it's I think that this method is a big potential in neuroscience. Uh, yeah, we used to, of course, we, we work a lot of neuroscience in IMAC and, and I've been working on this kind of methods for a while. Uh, and the only thing is that it's really important to try to work together with neuroscientists for making some something out of these methods, because I think you made it quite user friendly and I think it would be very useful to have these hierarchical models because usually fMRI data is not good enough for getting very reliable individual parcellations. Uh, I just wonder how much you are actually interacting. How does your institute work? How much you are interacting with actually working neuroscientists for translating this into neuroscience insights? Uh, so actually, like I'm uh, working, uh, I have weekly meetings with a neurosurgeon at uh, La Riboisière, which is a hospital in Paris, and uh, which is who is interested in functional parcellation for tumor removal, right? And we are also working with a neuroscientist called Daniel Margulis. I don't know if you ever heard about him, but mm -hmm. he's also like, a, um, so yeah, the, the goal is to really like bring this to the markets in, in a sense that you, you, see, you see what I mean, not to, to keep it in, in the boxes, uh, but to see how it actually scales with real life setups. So of course, um, it's, it's very hard, I think, to make a, a, a method that could be completely automatic and that would work end to end and give you what the, the perfect result that you want. So uh, the thing is that in that kind of work, there's still a bit of data engineering uh, to pre-process the data, to post-process the data. And, and, and there's a know-how that is still uh, belonging to the neuro experimenters uh, in that sense. But uh, uh, the parts of the Bayesian uh, inference, uh, because basically in the middle of the model, we try to make it as automatic as possible because this is the main pain point uh, that we have been observing, uh, at least in, in my team. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I uh, need to leave because I have another meeting. Uh, so really, um, you feel free to send us uh, like, uh, a mail if you have like a new version of the preprint on some other paper we should check out because I'm quite interesting to to follow for sure yeah this research direction go and um, Gianluigi uh, so I don't know if uh, uh, Gianluigi did you did we schedule <laughs> that? I guess there was some problem hello can you hear me yeah hello uh, I yes. lost you at the schedule. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we were planning also to present our stuff in your lab, was it? Yeah, it's, uh... it's planned. Uh, I think it's in November, if I'm correct, yeah. Gianluigi. It's yeah, it's in November. I don't remember the exact oh, way. Yeah, for see. cascading flows. Yeah, okay. and, uh, yeah, all the automatic structured operational inference line of work that we're doing. So if we can, if we will have uh, the preprint, the new preprint out, we can also yeah, sure. yeah. I'm really looking forward to that presentation. Actually, like, yeah, I think, for instance, Cascading Flows is a brilliant work. And uh, this is one of the baselines uh, I've been trying to implement in my paper. Okay, so, that's uh, cool. We probably did the TensorFlow probability implementation in parallel with Gianluigi because last time we talked, he was uh, still uh, uh, neck deep into it. <laughs> so, um, but this, yeah, uh, I think it's going to interest a lot of people. I, I won't hide to you that uh, inference is also kind of a recent interest in the parietal research team, which was much, much uh, dedicated to classical statistics uh, applied to fMRI data. But a lot of people are picking up the pace on this and will be interested to see your work. Okay, good, so, looking is. forward then. Uh, I really have to go, so. Uh, yeah, uh, so thanks for your time then. Thank you very much. Okay, see you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.